The next really big important piece of the puzzle is if we figure out how to do all of these things, will they even work? Will they have the benefits that we expect them to have on the reef? And so we've got to look at that just as much as do we have to do the engineering design of whether we can put the widgets on the reef, whether we can grow the corals, whether we can surface film an area, whether we can pump cool water into an area. That's the how to do it. But the real question that matters to all of these things is will it work? And so Dr. Ken Anthony with the Australian Institute of Marine Science is going to come up here shortly and talk us through some of the modeling that they're doing to do that work. Ken? Thank you, Tom. Thank you, organizers. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, audience, for keeping up your enthusiasm for staying around. I'm a biologist, and I worry about corals. I worry about corals because it is going to get tougher to be a coral. And I worry about corals because corals are the trees in the underwater rainforest. If it's going to get tougher to be a coral, it's going to get tougher for people. And it's going to get tougher for scientists, it's going to get tougher for us, it's going to get tougher for marine park managers, for coral reef managers. So the purpose of my talk is to ask this question for the Great Barrier Reef. Can restoration and adaptation help sustain coral condition on the Great Barrier Reef? And we're going to address this by looking at some of the most recent data coming out of the modeling team in the RAP program, the modeling team that I lead. So I'm talking here on behalf of a team of 10 hardworking modelers. And these are the bare bones. These are very much the bare bones of the model. So in essence, coral survivorship is affected by warming, bleaching, which is affected by climate change scenario. And here, Paris is representative concentration pathway 2.6. Business as usual is 8.5. We can counteract some of that mortality through cooling. Dan has talked about that a number of different ways. What we're going to do here is look at the scope. We're basically going to look at the system. We're going to apply the models. We're going to say, what can we achieve? If cloud brightening works, what's it going to give us? What kind of benefits is it going to give us for the corals? We can also boost coral survivorship by introducing warm adapted corals. That is your shtick. I've heard a lot of people here talk about that. So, so this is you. This is the work you're doing. What can we do? Small scale and at a massive scale. So David talked massive scale hundreds of millions of corals on the largest coral reef ecosystem. All right, let's try and plug that in. Crown of Thorns starfish have been responsible for over 40% of the coral decline on the Great Barrier Reef, and that was even before we had bleaching events, right? So if we could, through some magic means, if we could, through an extension of reef restoration and adaptation techniques, prevent those outbreaks, Imagine what we could do in terms of enhancing the resilience and taking away further stress. Now, these are just three of the interventions that we've looked at that I've chosen to show you today. We've done five or ten others that we could plug in, right? The, the National Academy of Sciences report, we're looking at 27 different things. Just think about, just think about the scope, if we could get these things to work. And here are John, only three of them. And this is a baby model, and we've taken this baby model, of course, and put it into the context of a much larger ecosystem model where lots of other things are happening in time and space, including cyclones, but also conventional management. So here we are including conventional management such as pollution control, marine park management, um, but also here we are making an assumption Let's imagine that conventional management is running as best practice because that sets up a line where we can say this is where conventional management ends. We know that's not really enough. And this is where reef restoration adaptation starts. 
And we've run these models for the entire GBR. We're running them for more than 2,100 reefs that are connected in this huge network. We're running the simulations from 2020 and now to 2080. And then, for the purpose of this exercise, what I've done is to take 10,000 data points for the northern part of the reef. And I'm going to plug them into another little mini model for the purpose of this, of today, a base net. And I'll, let me explain what that is. A base net is a network of conditional probabilities. These are linked likelihoods. And, and a little word of warning, they are addictive. They're addictive to people who are inquisitive, marine park managers, because what they do is they take the model data with the uncertainty and the complexity and they place them at your fingertips and they let you play. So we're going to try and play a little bit. What I've done here is I have set the network to Paris. So I've clicked the RCP 2.6 Button. So that says 100% now, so we're doing Paris. I've turned cloud brightening off. That's a no. Hardy corals I've turned off. And crown of thorn starfish we've turned off. So what we're looking at now are the results, the predictions with uncertainty for the no reef restoration and adaptation situation. So that's what David called the counterfactual. So the blue line you are seeing there is the con it is predicted coral cover from now up till 2080, right? That's, that's a story of decline. We have, if you look in the center box, we have less than 2% chance of sustaining coral cover larger than 40%. We have 75% chance of staying below 20% coral cover. That's a pretty sad story. What's interesting is that this is the premise of RAP. This is why we're doing RAP, because it says, even if we did Paris, it's not going to be enough. We're going to have decline. It's also partly the basis for the National Academy of Sciences report, where we go, it ain't going to be enough. We've got to do something else. Right. But this is Paris, and now this is business as usual. A much grimmer story. Here we would have 0.4% chance of sustaining coral cover if we didn't do reef restoration adaptation. So, let's try and turn the question around and say, well, if we as managers or scientists want to ask the question, what do we want? We want high coral cover. We're worried about coral cover because that's condition, that's habitat. Without that, no fish, no people, right? Or no, no happy people on reefs. So let's do that and then see what we need to do to get there. And if we just look from the top on the scenario, it says RCP 2.6, we have to have a 70% chance. What is the chance now of RCP 2.6? It's probably not 70%. Is it, Joni? Probably not. <laughs> and, and we would also need help from three interventions to get there. Let's now try and lock in the worst case, the business as usual, and see what happens. Well, it now says that we can have that, maybe with 83% chance by 2050. So our kids might be sort of almost happy. But we only have 16% chance of achieving this in the long term. And we would need help from all three interventions, right? Let's try and lock in 2075, because we are more worried, aren't we? We're reef lovers, so we're more worried about the long term than we are about the short term. Now, to get there, we would need help from cloud brightening, but something, something weird happens, because suddenly crown of thorn starfish control is much more important than hardy corals. Why is that? Is there, is there an answer in the room? It's weird. Maybe the model is just wrong. Or maybe, maybe it's because that under this scenario, it's hot, it's three degrees, it's 2075. So maybe here we're looking at losing corals and the starfish are starving, right? So 
planting more hardy corals is probably not going to work because we'd just be providing finger food to crown of thorn starfish. We may also be up against the point where cloud brightening is, is potentially exhausted. This is, this is now three degrees and cloud brightening can only maybe give us one or two degrees. So we're up against the wire here. Let's try and remind ourselves what the question was. Can restoration and adaptation help sustain coral condition on the Great Barrier Reef? What if we could just go eight cylinders, top gear, and pedal to the metal? Let's try and see what happens if we turn everything on. So we've done that here. This is Paris. We've locked in Paris. We've said we're going to do, and we look at the long term, and we go, yes to to bright clouds, we go yes to hardy corals, we go yes to perfect cuts control. And when you look at that, this is a fantastic result, right? 90% chance of sustaining coral cover above 20% right up to the end of the century. This is fantastic. For business as usual, it's a slightly different story, right? So 2050, it still looks good, right? There's a hump. We're still above 20% coral cover, so we're looking good. But looking out towards the end of the century, it's a story of decline. Even with all interventions turned on, this is eight cylinders, top gear, going, going pedal to the metal. So short-term success, reef and adaptation and, and, and restoration, great. But we have to think about what happens in the long term here. This is an article that's about four years old. And the solution, the suggested solution here is triage. Can't save everybody. Now, there's something you need to know about me. I am a coral-hugging hippie. <laughs> I look corporate on the outside, but in the inside, I'm dreadlocks, bare feet. After my first dive on a coral reef in 1986, I went back to Denmark, called Denmark, got a little bit depressed, and I set myself, I did three things. First, I quit engineering. Sorry, David, I quit engineering. I enrolled in marine biology, and I set myself a goal to save the world's coral reefs, or at least try to. So when I'm confronted now with the possibility of having to let go of the ecosystem that is closest to my heart. I'd say the hippie is not happy. This is how I see triage playing out, if that's where we're going. First, you try to save everybody. Then, you save the ones you can afford, or maybe the ones you serve you well. You serve the vulnerable, you save the vulnerable, the cute and the cuddly, but at the end, you just save the ones you can't live without. Is that where we're going? To me, this is not a happy ending for reef lovers. This is a story of a mother who had to give up a child to save the other, a selfish choice. I think we need much more than this. I think we can do much more than triage. I think we have the capacity, I think we have the will. Because if we run the gauntlet of severe climate change, we will be in a world of pain. The right side of this diagram is that world, where we potentially run out of the scope for healthy coral reef ecosystem. This is where corals can perhaps no longer survive. And without corals, no rainforests in the sea, and it's going to get tough for people. But if we can also, at the same time as we do fantastic reef restoration and adaptation, push to the left, mitigate, see what happens to the curve, see what happens to reef re restoration and adaptation, we suddenly have scope to do fantastic things disproportionately. And standing on top of a great foundation of conventional management that we don't stop, we just keep going. So the further we can push to the left, the greater the chance we have of sustaining coral condition and healthy coral reefs.
So I'm going to end with this appeal to you that every time we communicate, please, the importance of restoration and adaptation, let us also communicate that the success of restoration and adaptation is going to be contingent on us getting climate change under control. Thank you for your time.